to God be the glory for the life of Richard Hawk. Thanks be to God. We are gathered this morning to remember and to give thanks for the precious, wonderful life of Reverend Richard Lee Hawk. We gather today with both thanksgiving and sorrow. We give thanks for a wonderful life for a good man who has left such a powerful legacy of faith, of love, of family. We give thanks for Richard Hawk, for all that he has meant to us, for all that he has taught us, for the many ways that he has served and lived faithfully. And we also gather with sadness this day, for he is no longer with us here on earth. We rest in the promise that he is in the full and eternal presence of God, the God who created him, the God who loves him, the God he followed faithfully throughout his life. We know that God has welcomed Richard into God's full and glorious presence. And I believe God welcomed Richard with the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. And so we give thanks even as we grieve, and even as he will be deeply missed. For he was, as someone put on our church Facebook page when we shared about the service, he was one of a kind. He was a special man, a dear man, a joy to know. And so we give thanks to God for his life. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for Richard Hawk, your servant, your child, a sheep of your own fold, a sinner of your own redeeming. As you have redeemed him and claimed him as your own, we hold to that promise. We thank you, God, for the promise of eternal life, and we thank you for that for that reason we can grieve with hope this day. And so, God, we pray that as we grieve, you would offer comfort to our hearts. I pray that you would strengthen Nell and all of Richard's family and friends and loved ones and church family. Strengthen us this day, God. And help us to worship you as we gather for this hour. For this is a celebration of Richard's life, but even more, God, it is a celebration of you. For you created Richard. You called him, and he responded to that call, following you faithfully all the days of his life. And he worshipped you, and so we also worship you in celebration of his life. We thank you, God, for the gift of Richard Hawk. And we thank you for this time and space to remember him, to give thanks for him, and to lift up our hearts to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
couple of days ago, I asked Nell if there was any scripture that came to mind for it to remember Richard and to honor his life, and she immediately started quoting the words of John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. These are words of deep hope and great promise, words that I'm sure Richard clung to throughout his life and words that he offered to others, to other families who were grieving, to other people approaching the end of their own lives. And so this day, hear these words of Christ in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Richard devoted his life to following the way of Christ, to seeking the truth, to discovering the truth, to teaching the truth of Christ to others, and to following the way. He studied scripture, he taught scripture, he was a man of prayer. Richard's life exhibited faithfulness and devotion to following the way of Christ. He spent many years pastoring churches in Georgia and North and South Carolina, and for the past few years, he has faithfully taught Sunday school, our men's Sunday school class here, and more recently, a Wednesday morning Bible study class here at First Baptist Pendleton. Many days, I have walked past a room and peered in and seen Richard sitting around a table or sitting around a room with people with their Bibles open, listening to him share with them the truth the word of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. What a blessing it has been many Sundays to look out in the congregation right back over there and to see Richard nodding along. What a gift it is as a pastor to know someone is with me and he would so often be nodding along as I would say something, reveal something uh, from scripture, from Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. As a pastor himself, Richard was often a voice of encouragement He often had these deep comments after worship service, and sometimes he would say, you know what I mean? And I would think, not really. (laughs) He had a way of of saying something that that seemed to have different ways of looking at it, multifaceted. He was certainly a multifaceted person and a person of deep faith. Uh, We were both pastors, of course, but we had some other things in common as well. We both graduated from Mercer University, Go Bears. We both shared Georgia ties as he pastored in Metter, Georgia, and my family lived near Milledgeville, Georgia, so I was familiar with Metter as a stop on the way to the coast. Richard and Nell's great-granddaughter, Hadley Kate, was born right about the time of my oldest son, and so we shared that time together, waiting for our babies to be born, celebrating when they were born, and then sharing stories of their growth as they grew into toddlers and now children. It has been a gift to share this journey of life and faith with Richard and with Nell. And I know you too have stories of how Richard has blessed your life. We are live streaming our service today on Facebook, and I know those joining us online also have stories of how Richard has blessed your life. And so I encourage you to share these stories in the days to come, to share them with Nell and the family. These stories are a gift. They are a balm to grieving souls. They are a gift of life, reminding the family of the ways in which Richard's life and legacy lives on. We give thanks to God for the life and faith of Reverend Richard Lee Hawk. And we continue to hear stories, to hear scripture, to hear music which deeply touched his life as we celebrate his life, as we celebrate his faith, and as we give thanks to God.
My name is Joe Pace. I met Richard in 1971. I was less than 30 years old. I don't remember, let's see, Richard, uh, hmm, he's 11 years older than me, so uh, <clears throat> when I met Richard, I was a new pastor at uh, my second church in Seneca, and Richard uh, was First Baptist Walla Halla. And um, I'm sure they had some interesting services there because it didn't take long for anyone that was around Richard to realize that Richard was uh, different. His thought process was different. It wasn't bad. It was just different. He dared to ask questions like, why? Why do you believe that? Explain to me that. He could do that and have you scratching your head and trying to figure it out. Richard and I had many things in common. One of the things, uh, we both had wonderful wives. That always helps. Uh, Richard and I had uh, uh, the experience of playing golf. And any time you did anything with Richard, it was an adventure. I shall never forget. I, m many years ago, I said, Lord, uh, I know one of my problems is that I, I need patience. And he sent Richard into my life to teach me patience. <laughs> Vern, a dear precious friend, Vern and Richard and I, we many times golfed together. I shall never forget uh, sometimes uh, when you played golf with Richard, that was not his focus. That was not his main interest. His main interest was to share something with you, to tell you something when he thought about it, because if he didn't, he wouldn't think about it again. So uh, it, Richard would be, you know, he'd get set, and, oh, he was ready to hit that hole in one. You know, he was ready. And all of a sudden, he'd look at you and, uh, oh, let me tell you a story. And I'd say, hit the ball, you know. I mean, we're here to hit the golf ball. But, uh, more, I'm telling you, Vern, uh, I've got bad news for you. Uh, Richard has been telling his family that I was the one that hit the hole in one. The truth is, I was six inches from the hole. And Vernon, uh, he, he topped the ball. It bounced twice and went in the hole. He got the hole in one, so Richard and I had to go buy him a trophy. And I hope and pray that Vern still treasures that uh, even today. Speaking of Vern, uh, he is not here today to, uh, to read this. He didn't feel like he could and asked me if I would uh, read his reflections. So for just a moment, I'm sure most of you probably know Werner Burkett, but uh, I'm going to read what he had to say about Richard. I met Richard Hawk at Seneca Baptist Church. I taught young men's Bible class. Every Sunday, I would go into the class armed with my Baptist quarterly and my study outline from the Broadman Press. Each week, I would go armed with the teacher's book and the student book. All is well. What could possibly go wrong? However, okay, y'all ready? On this particular Sunday when I, went, when I went in there, there was a stranger, Richard Hawk. Seemed like a nice guy, friendly, ready to jump in on the lesson. I began to speaking from the Baptist resources I had brought with me. Richard listened patiently, then gently interrupted. Can you imagine such? Are you sure about that? And offered another answer, sharp. This, this guy knows his Bible. In a few weeks, I was frustrated. Richard would uh, be ready with new thoughts each week, which did not jive with my Baptist teacher book. Although I felt threatened, after all, I had the Baptist teacher's book. I enjoyed this banter, uh, banter with Richard. He was so knowledgeable of the Old Testament and after inquiring from people, I discovered he was a Bible scholar, a graduate of Mercer University. After a short while, I started calling Richard each week and talked about many things, 
and evidently uh, ending up talking about the, the Sunday school lesson next week. So I thought I would not be blindsided. I wanted to know what he had in mind for next Sunday, his thoughts on our Baptist lesson. Richard might uh, want to blindside me with my Baptist teacher book. Do not think he was being out of line. He was being helpful. Richard and I became best friends. We attended a Promise Keepers conference and claimed each other uh, that we would uh, be accountability partners. We began to have coffee together. We played our version of golf. Yes, many a time I was the third hand in that. And uh, man, I'll tell you some stories I could tell. Later, we began sampling milkshakes and teaching uh, waiters how to do their job and how to make milkshakes. Richard witnessed a number of young people while we were together. They loved Richard. Psalm 78, 4 says, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of our Lord. God supplied all my needs and has not failed me once. God blessed me by allowing a brother like Richard Hawk. Richard Hawk. On the golf course, everybody's, you know, trying to get that uh, little object in the hole real quick. And sometimes, all right, Richard's your time. Where's Richard? Where's he at? Oh, he's over there talking to somebody, and he doesn't even know who they are. And he's saying to them, uh, listen, tonight I'm going to be praying for you. Uh, is there a special reason that I need to ask the Lord to intervene in your life. I have never in my life met anybody except Richard that would do that. Uh, he was incredible. Uh, the Lord just lay on his heart. That person, they need prayer. Um, I know I needed prayer because my golf game wasn't what I wanted it to be, but Richard, he, he saw beyond that. He, he just, you go to a restaurant and he'd look up at the waiter or waitress and he would say to them, now your name is, okay, I'll be praying specially tonight for you. Is there a reason that I need to bring your name before the Lord? And you'd be amazed. People, they, they'd open up and talk. You know, Richard, Richard and I not only were minister friends, and not only golf buddies, uh, we, uh, as the years went by, uh, I went to seminary. And while I was at seminary, I was minister of music of a church, and, uh, and I needed a little side job to help pay the bills. So uh, I went to work with the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Commission. And while I was there, uh, Richard became one of the counselors. Uh, he he uh, uh, was different than the other counselors, I promise you. Uh, Richard, would, uh, he would think about a, a different way. Uh, maybe this would work for that person. And it, it was amazing. It really was. Uh, what a blessing he was. Uh, so many things that I, I could say about Richard. Um, a, cu a couple of weeks ago, Richard called me out of the clear blue and said, I want you to come to my house. I want to talk to you. And I, I was not aware that he was as bad off as he was. Uh, hospice is what had just come there when I got there and uh, had some time with the family and uh, had some time with Richard. And, of course, uh, it didn't take very long for Richard to uh, uh, be the focal point, and it didn't take long for him to uh, tell what's on his heart. Uh, if, he, if he thought something, he said it. He really did. And uh, you didn't have to worry about how you stood with him I'll never forget, Richard and I, we also love to paint. We we're artists, both of us. And uh, one day we decided to get, y'all may have heard of this place. I believe they call it Pendleton Square. And uh, we went to Pendleton Square and we set up and I set up all my art supplies and got everything ready to go. And we decided, both of us, we were going to paint that, uh, the old jailhouse there, the old jailhouse, the oldest in America. And boy, that's challenging. So about 10 o'clock, we started painting, and about 12, our, our stomachs, you know, we're Baptists, 12 o'clock, it's time to eat. So uh, we, uh, we did eat, and then we got back painting. 
And about four o'clock, uh, I was through, and Richard said, I'm through too. And I started packing my stuff up, and I looked over at Richard, and he had his painting. Very nice watercolors. Mine was in acrylics, but his was in watercolors. And it was right nice. I'm telling you, it's beautiful. And I, I looked, and Richard was tearing it in half. And I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, here's, he worked six hours on that painting, and here he is tearing it in half. And I said, what are you doing? He said, the fun in art is the doing of it. And I said, well, what if somebody wanted to look at that painting? Well, they can't now, can they? <laughs> that was Richard. That was Richard, I declare. You couldn't help but love him. There were a lot of people that didn't understand him. But the truth of the matter is, down deep in his heart, he cared. He cared about people. He cared about his family. He talked about his family. Uh, and I had the privilege several times of uh, being in the home and enjoying good fellowship with Nell and with Richard. What a pl pleasure that was. I thank God for my buddy Richard. There's a passage of Scripture, and uh, I, I would almost, I'm not a betting man, but I'd almost bet that this has probably never been used before uh, in a service such as this. But I couldn't help but think of Richard. Uh, many of you here today probably know Richard best as the guy who taught class. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1, Jesus, seeing the multitudes, went up into a mountain. And when he was set, he sat down. His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Richard enjoyed teaching. Richard enjoyed helping people to think deeply about the Bible. And I think we all have to appreciate him for that. The greatest thing that anybody can say about Richard Hall is that he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this moment, that's the only thing that really matters. He believed on Jesus. I know that he'd love to see all of us in heaven one day. And that can happen. And the way things look in this world right now, it may be sooner than later. So I hope that you're ready and that you know Christ is your Savior. Never forget, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May God bless us, and may he give us the strength and the courage that we need in the oncoming days.
Okay. Thank you. Well, I just walked with shivers up my spine thanks to Celeste. That's unbelievable. And I look at this and I see the worship of God in celebration of the life of Reverend Richard Lee Hawk. And you could just easily say the celebration of God through the life of Richard Lee Hawk. And um, I'm so glad everybody's here. And it's a beautiful day. It's just beautiful. Um, and um, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Um, talked to him a lot in the last couple of months. Um, and um, I said, what do you, we were just kind of going through a conversation as we did, and as, as I will do in my life, speaking to him in heaven. But that partic particular day, uh, I said, what do you be, want to be remembered for? And he said, um, my family, you know, my wife, my family. And that was the standard answer. But I just, I just gave a little uh, prod, and he said, the people I saved, the lives that he saved, the people he guided through faith, uh, the, addic the addicted that he helped overcome addiction, the people he counseled who in, were in marriage and had troubles. And those people, after I asked the second time, what do you want to be, that was what he said. The people he saved, the people he baptized, the lives that he helped guide through uh, the Christian way and um, he loved the gospel he really he loved the gospel um, I miss him so much and I just want to say please pray for my mother she's had two weeks of tough and everybody here and um, I'll be praying with you and uh God bless him. That's all. I've got that right. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Daddy would love this. He would absolutely love this. Um, seeing everybody, the music, Celeste, Skyler, we can never thank you enough. Burner, thank you for your reflections. Skyler coming from Nashville to play for Daddy. Celeste, our cousin, playing beautifully. We just can't thank you enough. Um, Saturday morning, Daddy woke me up early, <laughs> like he always did. And um, I started writing, and I wrote for a couple of hours. And I was doing good until Rod spoke. <laughs> Rod said, I'm going off the cuff. I said, good, good for you. Um, you did great, thank you. Thanks to everybody for being here today. Thank you for your cards, your love, your prayers. The phone calls, the food have meant so much to my family. We can't thank you enough. If you knew my dad, Richard Hawk, for only a few minutes, you found out that he was a servant of Christ, unashamedly sharing his testimony and wanting to hear your story. He did not meet a stranger, as Joe said. He would quickly make a joke, search your heart, or ask you questions to get to know you. And like Joe said, he would ask, what can I do for you? What can I pray with you about? He would tell every waitress or waiter we had, you're the best one I've had today. Now what can I pray with you about? And third, he adored his family. His bride, Nell, was the love of his life. 
And Daddy would not have been able to do <laughs> without my mother. My mother has been the strong supporter all, all of his, their marriage um, since she met him in about, what, Mama, 1955, I believe. Um, they've been married 63 years and dated for a couple of years before that, so at, at least 65 years they've been together. But he was just a boy from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he, he would often say, how could a boy from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania marry a sweet Southern girl from West Palm Beach, Florida? And he would instantly respond, only God. Daddy told of his birth with pride, that a premature baby from Pittsburgh grew up to be a good-sized man, the first in his family to be born in a hospital. He grew up one of four brothers that got pretty rowdy at times, but Daddy always won all the fights. In his stories, he, he was always the winner of the fights. <laughs> his litany was that he started working at a paper, um, he had his own paper route at age eight. By 10, he was smoking. By 12, he was drinking. And age 17, he said, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> So he left Pittsburgh and joined the Air Force, and he knew um, he knew he got he had to he would say break that chain. Um, he was stationed in Denver, Colorado, and when a choice was made about where to go next, he wanted to go to Germany. He wanted to serve overseas during the Korean War. Well, he says the Air Force got mixed up and sent him to Georgia rather than Germany. <laughs> And so there he went to Georgia, but the Lord was working all this out according to his plan. Well, all the guys at Moody Air Force Base near Valdosta, Georgia, where Winona also grew up, and they connected later in life, um, my dad and his buddies, they knew where the prettiest girls were in town. They would go to First Baptist Church Valdosta. And Daddy especially loved to go on Sunday night for choir, fellowship, and to eat some good food. There in the choir was a beautiful girl who could sing high soprano. He had no idea that, that she was the preacher's daughter. He also had no idea that when he met Dr. James P. Rogers, his life would drastically change. Only God. Dr. Rogers, my grandfather, schooled my dad in not only the gospel, but also in the precious protection of his daughter, Nell Celia. His influence and witness to the word of, of God led Daddy to yield his life to whatever the Lord had in store for him. The Lord called Daddy to full-time ministry in 1955, and the tra trajectory of his life took a drastic change. In 1957, he married that preacher's daughter, and then attended Mercer University, the first and only college grad of his family. I was born while he attended Mercer, right after he graduated from Mercer, I was born. And then he went on to Southeastern Theological Seminary where Rick was born while they were living there. Daddy first served Appalachian Baptist Church near Madison, Georgia while he attended Mercer then Tally Ho Baptist when he was in seminary. He also helped build a mission church, Greenwood Forest Baptist in Cary, North Carolina, that is still active today. When Daddy graduated from seminary, his father-in-law, James P. Rogers, said, come preach, come preach at First Baptist Valdosta. There's a pulpit committee that wants to hear you. They're from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. My mom was so excited because she was born in Florida. And so they want to hear you. Well, that church did not call him, but another pulpit committee was there that day from Metter, Georgia, and they did call him. Metter, Georgia was heaven on earth to my parents. They moved into a brand new parsonage, were showered with love by the people from day one. The memories of Metter were so vivid and dear to us that recently Daddy had a vision of buying five acres back in Metter building a church, a farm, five barns, a school to mentor new pastors, assist neglected women and children, and to have some gardens, he called them victory gardens, 
and he was going to support Samaritan's Purse through all this and more. Matter was also the home of the Seeds of the Sower ministry that was started by Michael Guido. My brother Raj was born while we lived in Matter, and the, the doctor came out to congratulate the new father. And Michael Guido was there with Mama because Dad, Dad was home with me and Rick. And so Michael Guido was presented a new baby boy, and um, <laughs> quickly they realized the mistake and the doctor, um, but that's how close Daddy and Michael were. Um, the Lord next called Daddy to Wahala first, where he served for 10 years, and Open Door Baptist, where he served for seven. He was also interim pastor at numerous churches in Oconee County, including Wolf State, Shiloh, and Seneca. And he also worked at the Pickens County Drug and Alcohol Abuse Commission and for the Oconee County School District. Daddy became involved in the community where we lived through coaching ball teams. He coached football and matter and bas football, basketball and matter, basketball, baseball, and softball in Oconee County. He served on the Rosa Clark Medical Board and the founding board for Laurel Estate Housing Development in Wahala. Daddy loved any sport. You've heard about his golf game. He loved that. Um, and he played many sports in high school. Over the years, he's also, he loved fishing, golfing, tennis, swimming. Whether he was playing golf with Werner and Joe here in this area, um, he also loved to play with John Jones in Matter, Georgia. Every Monday morning, he and John would play. He loved fishing with Grace and Jack Taylor or going down the river, the Ch Chattooga River with Max Gates. He was living life. He was always living life to the fullest. His competition spilled over into his sermons, and he recruited many players to first come to the church and then join the ball team. Chicopee Field, many Saturday nights, kept the lights on late for the softball, the church softball games, but Sunday morning, you were expected to be in the Lord's house. My brother Rick also reminded me that Daddy would encourage competition among the many bakers in the church. He'd say, I believe we need to have a potluck supper or a covered dish dinner. We need to get together. He loved fellowship. And he'd say, I, I believe one of you ladies would just love to make a coconut cream pie. Or would somebody like to make a carrot cake? And he would get that started, and by Wednesday, we had a full meal. Um, my, for those of you that don't know, my Aunt Susan, Mama's sister, she passed away on Daddy's birthday just a week before he did. And he and Susan loved good competition, too. They loved to play games together, like Scrabble and other games. And so I am sure that Susan um, was so glad she beat Daddy to heaven and was there to greet him and probably started up a game right away between the two of them. Daddy also loved traveling. He traveled to the Holy Land. He traveled to Europe, um, Haiti, Jamaica, and Mom and Daddy took a wonderful um, cruise together on their 25th anniversary that they talked many times about. He lo also loved to travel t with Mama to Texas, New England, Washington, D.C., Florida, but nothing compared to the annual trip to Ocean Isle Beach with, the, with our family. As I mentioned, Daddy loved family and being together. He'd start planning the meals. Like I said, he loved to plan the meals weeks in advance, whether it was a cookout, Thanksgiving meal, meeting at a restaurant. But before the beach trip each year, he'd start planning those meals and the gear that he wanted to take, He'd pack for weeks in advance, get his bocce ball equipment together, his handball equipment. Everything had to, had to be ready for that beach trip. And he, would, he loved planning that. This year, we went in June, and he stood. This was his last trip, and you know we had no idea, of course, but he stood at the end of the boardwalk and looked out over the ocean. He stood with help and he joy, enjoyed the breeze and the sun with Mama carefully watching. Um, his other vision, just Thursday night, his last night with us, his, his other vision was to build a beach house that we could all enjoy together. He said, it's gotta have nine bedrooms, five bathrooms, and so everybody can enjoy it. It got bigger and bigger as he talked about it. Spending time, speaking of family, he always said, that the Lord brought him to South Carolina to get Tim. <laughs> so, 
to gain Tim as a son, and that the Lord sent Rick to Georgia to get Amy as a daughter. And the birth of his 11 grandchildren, were, each one was so special and exciting to him. He always spoke so proudly of his family, and when Hadley was born, he was ecstatic. He could not wait to hold Hadley, have that first great-grandchild. Caitlin, Anna Grace, JP, Elijah, Sarah, Charlie, Samuel, Athena, William, Aubrey, Kathleen, Josh and Melissa, you are so adored. By whether you called him Pap, Pops, um, you and Nana, uh, you are so adored by, by Daddy and Nana. You've, not, you've known the same unconditional love that Rick, Raj, and I have had. You've heard Daddy talk of his dreams for you. Go, go get them. Go do them. Go after them. Growing up at the breakfast table was always very interesting. You talk about being asked questions. Daddy would often say, what are you doing with your life? What's going on? What are you doing with your life? He would challenge us to be our best, to stretch our minds, but always there was, what is God doing? What is God doing in your life? I recently had to call and cancel some of my dad's upcoming appointments, and each person I talked to, it's such a witness to me, each person expressed their enjoyment at talking to daddy, their conversations with him. But they quickly said, and we loved hearing about the grandchildren. He always talked about the grandchildren. And he considered Josh and Melissa his grandchildren just as much as, as the others. And he loved to talk about anything military with Josh and anything spiritual with Melissa. If you visited mom and dad, you felt welcomed in their home. Mama always the gracious hostess, and daddy, of course, wanted to talk. He talked. He talked up until the very end. Um, he was saying, wow. Friday morning, um, I was on the phone with Caitlin and Hadley was going to school, and he, they heard him too. He was saying, wow, oh my, as he entered into the glorious kingdom early Friday morning. What a privilege it's been for me to be his daughter. Um, growing up, the three of us would get embarrassed when Daddy would joke with a new friend or stranger, like Joe talked about, talk, talking to anybody. And recently, while taking him to the hospital, we, the several times we went, he, um, you know, the screener questions they ask, um, he, they, would, they would start asking him the questions, but pretty soon he was the one asking the questions. And he would tell, he'd always say, you're doing a good job. <laughs> And when the screener question, do you smoke, came up, he would say, should I? <laughs> and then he'd say, I used to, but I married a beautiful girl and I had to stop. The, fr the three of us always knew we could call Daddy for any reason at any time. He may not agree with us, but he would call us back later and talk to us he would listen to us. He may not agree with us, but he would listen to us and tell us he was praying for us, and then he would call us back and ask many questions. Daddy was my person. He, the two of us just, we got each other. Um, he was very uncondition, unconventional, as Joe said. We were not the typical preacher's family, and that got us in a lot of trouble at times. But we knew forgiveness, love, and faith. He was bigger than life to me growing up, and he guided me to the Word of God every time. He taught us faith, forsaking all, I trust him. He taught us to live by that. And in 2 Corinthians, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. I know the new that he's experiencing is unbelievable. And I want to thank Open Arms Hospice, especially Elena, Angie, and Chaplain Joe Ferry. They were wonderful to us. Their patience goes beyond the call. And Melissa, we can never thank you enough for the love, devotion, and care that you've shown Daddy and our family. 
Melissa has re recently graduated with a PA degree from medical school, and she is looking for a job. <laughs> she said, I know the reason I've not gotten a job, and that's to be with PAP these days. So we, we can never thank you enough, Melissa. 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is what Daddy lived by. The love that Richard, Daddy, Pat Pops have shown us will live forever. One last Richard story. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> When I was working at the Alcohol and Drug Abuse as a counselor, and Richard was also a counselor there, uh, Richard uh, quite often would break into song. And if you know Richard, he could really sing when he wanted to. There were times he was a little bit silly, and there were times that he was serious as he could be. And one of the ladies that worked at the commission uh, she really loved the Lord and she loved her church and they were having a revival. And so she went to Richard and said to him, I would love for you to sing before the preacher preaches. And Richard said, I'll be there. What time? And it was that night. So Richard came to me and said, uh, I want you to introduce me. Mm, okay, what do you want me to say about you? Whatever the Lord puts on your heart. Okay. And uh, we got to, uh, it was an independent Baptist church, and they were rather expressive. They were rather excited. And uh, they had some singing, and they had some good singing, and man, the music was uplifting, and people were shouting, and people were, some, some of them was jumping up and down, and uh, it was amazing. And then came Richard's time. And so I got up and I introduced him. I didn't talk too long. I gave a nice introduction. And Richard came up there, and as only he could, he started singing, It is well with my soul. And he sang that first verse and got down to the course. And, of course, the, the course says... It is well. And he stopped and said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Today, you can imagine the reaction of that uh, church. They were expecting him to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And instead, he said, it's going to be okay. And he's one of the few that could actually do something like that on the spur of a moment. Just, it's going to be all right. If you know Christ is your Savior, it's going to be all right. May God bless and help us as only he can. Father, we come to the end of this memorial service. What a character. What a man. What a friend. What a family. Lord, we're grateful that you're with us. We're grateful for the precious memories of us, family, and friends. We're grateful that you are going to help us as we deal with his passing and as we look forward to seeing him in heaven one day before long. Lord, bless and help us as only you can, and we'll praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Thank you.